Amen. All right. Let's take our Bibles and let's go to Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8 tonight. We, are, we saw the life of Stephen, the first martyr. Tonight we're going to be talking about Philip. And um, so let's get into it. Acts chapter 8. And here we find Saul was consenting unto the death of Stephen. And uh, at that time, it says, there was a great persecution against the church which was set at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad. <clears throat> I'm going to have to have a drink of water. Ruby, if you don't mind. Yes. Thank you. Something. That hot dog I had just a minute ago has decided it wants to play with my back of my throat. I bet that was exciting to watch on TV, <laughs> wasn't it? <laughs> I want you to understand, in this part of Acts, I, you know, again, exciting things. You know, here's what happens as a church. If things are going really good, everybody's just satisfied and they just hang out and they just, and like we want to be together, you know, church wants to be together and nobody wants to leave. Nobody wants to have to be separated out. Nobody wants to have to do that. And that's fun and exciting and God allows that and wants it. But then there comes a place where God says, you know, enough's enough. It's time to move. It's time to, I need to get you moved out of your comfort zone. And kind of like what's happened to us. Amen. Kind of move us out of our comfort zone. And that's exactly what's happened in Jerusalem. Jerusalem, since Pentecost, has just been on fire. The church has been growing. I mean, they've had everything in the world has been just positive, positive, positive. God added to the church and he multiplied to the church. Uh, people were giving. People were taking care of each other. Until we have uh, chapter 6 where the, the uh, Grecian widows felt left out. We sense a little bit of a, a turn there. But then, then when Peter and John are attacked and then the apostles are attacked, we realize that Jerusalem is, there's a change taking place in Jerusalem. There's some there's some problems that are coming and uh, as they come uh, many of the folks that had come there for Pentecost now are leaving you know it's time to go uh, you know things aren't aren't going quite so well and so let's go and they're leaving and they're carrying the gospel and that's what's interesting about that it's God scattering the church so the church can carry the gospel to the next level of mission work Remember Acts chapter 1 verse 8, he says, he said, you shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem. Well, they've done that. In fact, so much so that they've been accused of turning the town upside down with this gospel. Uh, so now it's time for the next one, which is Samaria, Judah. So they've got to move in order to do that. They can't stay in Jerusalem and do that. They've got to move. And so God is sending them out and now they're expanding out and they're going, even though it's under persecution, it's God moving them. If you remember Paul, Paul had always wanted to just, this is just a side note, but this is the way God works. Paul had always wanted to go to Rome. Remember that? He always wanted to go to Rome, always. And in his mind, I think he had his mind, he was going to sail over in one of, the, one of uh, Caesar's ships and he was going to be taken care of and he would get there and he would go to the church and he would preach and it would be all great. God got him there, but God took him on a prisoner ship, took him as a prisoner. And that was by purpose and design when you look at it because God wanted him around those soldiers because the soldiers were the ones that were leaving Rome and going to the uttermost parts of the world. And so as Paul is brought into Rome as a prisoner, he's, he's got guys that are chained to him 24-7 and he's witness to those guys. They're getting saved and then they get transported to a new post and they go off and they carry that gospel out into Europe and Germany and all these other places and uh, the gospel is spread even though it's not quite like you would have planned it, you know? God has his mission work and he knows how to get it done. Amen. And this is exactly what we have happening here through this persecution that's happening with the church. And, and, the, and those who are persecuting the church are feeling a little more free to persecute because uh, of what's happening with Stephen, what happened with John and, and uh, Peter. They feel a little more comfortable, be a little more outspoken. And now with the, the, uh, the martyrdom or the killing of Stephen, the stoning of Stephen, they really feel like that they have the right or they can go after the church. And so here they go and those that are after the church. And Saul, soon to be Paul, is one of those. Consenting to his death, he said. 
And it says, and they were scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles, it says, at the end of verse 1. There they is, Judea, Samaria, those are the next two places that they're to go, according to Acts 1.8. Except the apostles. Huh. Wonder why they didn't go. Have any idea? Huh? God didn't send them. That's right. The, the church at Jerusalem is still going to, the church at Jerusalem is the church. I mean, that's, that's the, that's the center point of Christianity now. And these apostles are still there doing the work of the church. And so this is what's happening. So we understand that. And so this is what happens, except the apostles. Verse two, and devout men carried Stephen. And you'll notice to his burial is italicized. They carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. Um, this was an honor for Stephen that they would take him and carry him to his death. He, he's died now to carry him and bury him or take care of him. However, they would carry him. Either he was either he's cremated or he was buried. And, uh, but they took care of him and they lamented over him. I mean, he was loved. He was cared for. And even though they couldn't stop what was happening uh, at the stoning, they were, they were going to take care of him. They were going to honor him. Verse 2. Verse 3, as for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house and hailing men and women, committing them to prison. So Saul, after he's seen Stephen die, if it affected him, it sure doesn't seem like it affected him very long because it wasn't long. He's at it again. And again, I think it's because of the, the, the uh, motivation or the momentum that was gained through Stephen's stoning that he now has this uh, goal. And he is probably leading this. He's probably the guy that's the go-to. He's, he's out front in uh, causing this kind of havoc in the church. And again, that is all part of God's plan to split the church up, to send it out so that the gospel is carried out to other parts of the world. Verse 4, therefore, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere, <laughs> doing what? Preaching. Preaching the word. See, that's what God wanted to happen. And they were following through, even though they were leaving under persecution, they just continued to preach the word. I, I got to say something about these guys. You know, if you're run out of a church or you feel like you're run out of a situation, you feel like you've been... Uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, persecuted for no reason, you know? You might get a bad attitude, you know? You might leave there going, now nah, I'll tell you what, I, I'll leave here and I'll tell you what, no sorry guys coming after me. I'm just a Christian. I'm just trying to live the Christian life. What in the world do they think they're doing? I can't believe they want to attack me. I'm a good person. I don't know. But these guys, they leave there going, okay, let's go. Hey, listen, have you heard about Jesus? Hey, have you heard about Jesus? Let me tell you. Hey, have you heard about Jesus? Hey, y'all gather up. I want to teach you a lesson about Jesus. I mean, they didn't let that bother them. There may have been some, but I tell you what, they went on preaching the word. That's what you got to do. Don't let people, don't let circumstances keep you from being the Christian God has called you to be. They were still the church. And I talked about this the other day. I don't know what service it was, but I talked about that we are the witnesses. That's who we are. We're the miracles. I was last Wednesday night. We're the miracles. We're the ones. No, it was Exodus. We're the miracles. Or was it Ezekiel? Or was it? It was one of them anyway. But we're the, we're the, we're, we are the witness to the world of what Christ does to a person when he changes us. And if we fall back into that old grumpy, gripey kind of self, we're not a witness for Christ. We're not being who we're supposed to be. So we need to be these kind of people that no matter what the circumstance, we're just going to do what God called us to do. And they were doing that. They just went everywhere preaching the word. <clears throat> Verse 5. Then Philip, we met Philip a while ago because he was one of the seven who was chosen to be a deacon. But now, notice this, he went down to the city of Samaria. Okay, hang on. I want you to understand, this is Philip, a Jew, in Jerusalem, right after Pentecost. The door to the Samaritans has not been opened yet. That's what this is all about. And here is a... A deacon in the church 
one of the apostles, one of the leaders, and he says, you know what? If I'm going to be persecuted and I've got to leave Jerusalem, I'm going to go where no man has dared to go. Amen? What's the, what's the song? What's the song? Star Trek. Star Trek, yeah. How does that go? Help me out, Jacob. Oh, you don't know? <laughs> Do what? Long ago, where no one's gone before. Boldly. Boldly, where no one's gone before. There you go. So he decides to go where no man has ever gone before. That's Samaria. Jesus had visited there. Remember that? Jesus had a Samaritan woman, John chapter 4. He went there. So that was the Samaritan woman. That was in Samaria. And remember the disciples asked him, said, what are we doing here? Why would we go this way? What are you doing talking to a Samaritan woman? This was not the place to go as a quote unquote orthodox or a, or a Jewish person. Uh, they thought the Samaritans were dogs. They called them that, dogs. They weren't worthy of God's love. Uh, they were kind of half Jew, half Gentile, and that just made them um, uh, undesirables. And, uh, but here goes Philip, down there right in the middle of them, goes down there, and what does he do? He starts preaching, listen to this. He went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ. Well, that's the main objective, isn't it? Preach Jesus, wherever you go, just preach Jesus. And so he was preaching Christ unto them. Who's them? Samaritans. Samaritans. Well, they weren't at Pentecost. They had not received the Holy Spirit. They had not been saved at Pentecost. Why in the world would he go to a place where nobody had ever been saved before and where the Holy Spirit hadn't been revealed before? Why would he go there? Well, I'll tell you why. Because God took him there. That's why. So he did there. And look at this. And what happens? And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake. There is a revival in Samaria. Not just a few. Not just a handful. Every one of them, they were in one accord. The people with one accord gave heed to the things that Philip spake. And what gave him credence? They were hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. Again, we've seen that and talked about that these miracles, they were done. And, uh, and they, were the, they were what God used to uh, credit or to... Um, um, dumb brain work... <laughs> To give credibility to the message that Philip was preaching. And man, did they come. And it says, which spake, hearing and seeing the miracles, which he did. And so what happened? Well, demon, these demons possessed. For unclean spirits crying with loud voice came out of many that were possessed with them. And many taken with palsies, that sickness, and, and that were lame. Those with the handicap were healed by this one man. You know what? Sometimes we get to thinking, what could one man do? Well, here it is. Amen. Here's what one man sold out to preaching Christ can do. Just one man. That's all it takes. One person that's willing to let Christ use them. That's all it takes. And Samaria is having a revival. Now, if I'm Philip and I'm an evangelist and I'm preaching and I'm seeing this kind of result, man, I'm having the time of my life. I mean, everybody he talks to is getting saved. Everybody he talks to wants to hear the message of Christ. This is exciting. But there was a certain man called Simon, which before time in the same city used sorcery and bewitched people of Samaria, giving out that himself was some great one. This was a false preacher. This is somebody that came on the scene with a ulterior motive to convincing people that he was great with God. That in some way he possessed these great uh, miracle working powers. But you know what's interesting to me? That the people saw the difference. They must have. Because they're listening to Philip and they quit listening to Simon. And so now he's, he's, uh, he's, he's, he's got a problem. To whom they gave heed from the least to the greatest, saying, this man is the great power of God. So until this point, they were accrediting everything he did to God. 
Now, you realize how easy that is for people to do? They do it today. You know, well, he uses his Bible. I think he must be of God. You know, he, I heard him use the scriptures, and he must be of God. And, uh, you know, he, he, he has healing services, and people, looks like they get healed on TV and on the Internet. Looks like they get healed, so they must be of God. And, you know, and, and other people, other preachers come along. Oh, he's the greatest preacher that's ever lived. You need to come here, so-and-so. And, so. and uh, they've convinced people that they are of God. But these, these, Simon especially, he used sorcery. And bewitched people. He wasn't of God. You couldn't say he was of God because he used sorcery. He used witchcraft to accomplish the things that he did. You know, Satan is a great counterfeiter. Boy, don't ever forget that. He'll counterfeit anything God's doing. And he's great at it. So much so that in the end times it says that even the elect could have been fooled. He has a great ability to counterfeit the things of God. I think that's what's happened in the churches over the last hundred years. Amen. Satan's come along and counterfeited the things of God. And people have been drawn to that. And they're drawn away from the truth of Jesus Christ. They've grown away from the importance of growing in Christ. Of building a relationship with Jesus. It's now a performance. It's now a help me feel good. If you want me to it's like a it's like an addict. Uh, that uh, needs a fix. It just I got to go to this service because they'll they'll do things there to make me feel good. I got to go there and get feel good, you know. And uh, they, they go seeking that over and over and over again, but it just <clears throat> it doesn't ever completely satisfy. It's only that relationship with Jesus Christ will ever satisfy. Amen. And to him they had regard because that of the long time he had bewitched them with sorceries. And so he had convinced them. He had, he had so convinced them that he was the truth. And he had bewitched them to the point that they weren't willing necessarily to let go of him that easily. <clears throat> but when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, <coughs> they were baptized. Both men and women. Something different happened. You know, God changes a life. It's a whole lot different than whenever men's able to change a life. Yeah. You know, there's been a lot of guys, um, uh, motivational speakers that come in and they can motivate and they can stir guys up. You know, there's uh, uh, guys that I think it's a great job. They come into football teams and basketball teams and uh, they come into people who are uh, 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 organizations and they pump them up and they get them all charged up and they get them where they're ready to go charge the world and they walk out of there feeling like champions you know but you know there's a difference between that feeling and the feeling whenever you've met with God I'm telling you there's a big difference God's feeling of completeness or his feelings that he gives us of of being one with him I want to tell you there's nothing like it so uh so this is different, and he realizes, uh, Simon realizes there's a difference, and he listens, and he watches, and they believe, it says, and they believe, that's salvation, they believe Philip's preaching and the things concerning the kingdom of God, and the name of Jesus Christ. Didn't what they do? They got baptized, both men and women, that tells me they got saved. They were saved, and then they were baptized, men and women. Everybody was getting baptized. Man, I'm telling you, this is a great revival. He's following all the way through. He's following the Great Commission, and he went, he told them, and then he brought them into the church, and now he's baptizing. And uh, boy, he's, everything's moving in the right direction. Verse 13, then Simon himself believed also. Hey, wait, wait a minute. You mean that old sorcerer got saved? He believed also? I tell you this. I'm not one to question a person's salvation. But I would question Simon's salvation. He may have believed, but I'm not sure he believed in all the right things. And I'll show you that. And he was baptized. I think he got wet. I don't think he was baptized. You know, I, that's what I say. A person gets baptized and they're not saved. They just got wet. That's all they got. Uh, you, you have to be saved before you're baptized. But he says he believed also. And when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and wondered. What was he wondering Beholding the miracles and signs which were done. He was a magician. He, was, he could do things with sorcery and witchcraft. All the, he had the ability to do these kind of things. But he couldn't do anything like they were doing. 
Man, they were healing people and casting out demons. This was something he'd never seen before. Oh, he could do little things, you know, but it wasn't anything like this. And as he watched them, he was beholding those. He was wondering, how in the world are they doing it? Because, see, it was a sleight of hand for him. He knew there was some trick to it. And so he's looking for the trick. He's looking for how he might be able to do what they were doing. Now, when the apostles, which were at Jerusalem, heard... Now, then, we got a sh this is a shift, and you need to see this. We just, we're going we're to come back to Simon in a minute. But all of a sudden, there's something else that's happened, and this is real important. Now, when the apostles, which are at Jerusalem, heard that Samaria had received the word of God... Now, here's what happened. Philip's up there all by himself, right? There's no other Jews with him. There's nobody to report back to the church at Jerusalem. Jerusalem at Pentecost had experienced the, the coming of the Holy Spirit and it was something new and they got saved and then they, were, they, they received the Holy Spirit and, and this was new to them and they're going around, man, we've never had anything like this. This is awesome. It's because we're God's people. We're God's chosen. It's the Jews. It's us. That's why we got that. Well, remember, Acts is transitional. And now we're going to get God opening up the door to another group of people, not just the Jew, but now to the Samaritans, have to have Gentiles. But what has to happen is that God needs to get a witness back to Jerusalem. Well, nobody's there with Philip. So what does God do? God goes down to Jerusalem and said, hey, guys, hey, 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 listen up. There's something going up Samaria. Y'all need to get up there and see what's going on. So what do they do? They send John, Peter, John up there. So watch what happens. So uh, where am I? Uh, they saw that they received God. They sent unto them Peter and John, verse 15, who, when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. Now, if you're, if you're reading this, it can really confuse you about the coming of the Holy Spirit. You know that I teach and I believe from the scripture, from what Paul teaches in Romans, that you receive the Holy Spirit at salvation. But see, somebody will come along and say, but wait a minute, Brother Jim, in Acts... We noticed that the Samaritans were saved and baptized and then received the Holy Spirit. That must be the way it works. And so we have a whole group of people out there that believe that the uh, filling of the Holy Spirit or the indwelling of the Holy Spirit is a second blessing. It's something that you receive after you're saved and baptized. But remember, we're in Acts. It's transitional. And this time we're going to see that they, are, they receive the Holy Spirit after that. But that doesn't mean that it's always going to be that way. Philip was there, they're preaching, they get saved, baptized, and they need, they need a witness to the fact that they're going to receive the same Holy Spirit that those in Jerusalem had. And so now Peter and John, when they get there, they realize that salvation has taken place, they've been baptized, but they haven't received the Holy Spirit, and they knew that that was part of what happened at Pentecost, and so now they pray for that to happen here. For as yet, it says, verse 16, He, the Holy Spirit, was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. They'd been baptized in water, but not by the Holy Spirit. 17. Then laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. Who? Peter and John. Who are they? They're the Jews from Jerusalem. They lay hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. And here's what I'm going to tell you. As we walk through this, you're going to see every time the Holy Spirit is given to a group of people, Jews had to be there who could go back and report to the church of Jerusalem. So that the church of Jerusalem knew that they received the same thing that they had. You say, why is that important? Because God's opening up the church to everybody. Jew, Gentile, it makes no difference. It's open to everybody. And he's using this as the, the, the way to show that. Uh, by the end of Acts, the Holy Spirit has come to the Jew, the half Jew, half Gentile, to the, to the Gentile. So there's nobody else left that he can come to as far as uh, the people groups. That's it. You're either Jew or Gentile. And so they've all come and the door is open then for the church for all to come, receive Christ and be filled or indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God. Now then, any question before I move forward? Everybody good? Okay, look at this. And when Simon, all right, here we go back to Simon. I, I gotta tell you what's inferred here so that you'll know what happened. These folks saved, baptized, they are on fire, they're excited, and Peter and John show up, and Philip says, this is Peter and John, they're from the church of Jerusalem, and these folks, 
they man, they're excited over share, and they start they they start realizing they, that that something's happened in Jerusalem that hadn't happened here yet, and that's the coming of the Holy Spirit. Peter and John start praying for them to receive it, and it's something that's visible. So we assume, I believe we assume, I don't think we ever find out here, but we assume because we see it in Jerusalem and we're going to see it uh, later on in Acts chapter 10 with the Gentiles, they, they were speaking in tongues. Tongues was given. And tongues was an evidence of the coming of the Holy Spirit. Simon saw that. That's why he says, and when Simon saw that with the laying on hands, the apostles' hands, the Holy Ghost was given. See, he saw something. And I believe it was the fact of as they, they laid their hands on them and they spoke in tongues and they realized this is something from God. And Simon had never seen anything like that. And Simon said, I got to have some of that. Now, what's this? Uh, the Holy Ghost is given to them. He offered them money. You see, that's why I kind of want to question his salvation. I don't think he realized this was of God. I think he really thought this was just another, they were just another group of guys like he was, and they're going to do better than he is now, and he wants in on the game. Now, that's, that's Newton theology. I'll just tell you that right now. I just, that's my opinion. If you don't agree with me, that's okay. I just want to tell you that I think this is what's wrong with this guy. He says, verse 19, saying, Give me also this power, as if they had the power to give them. This is power of God, and that on whomsoever I lay hands... He may receive the Holy Ghost. It appears that this power is reserved for the apostles only because he's not going to get it and no one else is. This is for Peter and John who were apostles. And that's where I go back to telling you that, the, that this uh, gift of tongues is an apostolic gift. And here we see that in detail. They were the ones. They were the instigators. They were the ones that set it out. Verse 20. But Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Instead of it being given by grace, by the gift of God, he wants to buy it. I think there's a lot of preachers, false teachers, false preachers, that think they can buy anything. They can buy people. They can buy... Their churches, they can buy all the things it takes to get to fill up a building. And they'll pay for it and do whatever they have to because they know the, re the return is good. But when it's a gift of God, it's not about money. It's just by grace. Verse 21. Thou hast neither part, and they're talking to Simon. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter. For thy heart is not right in the sight of God. Now, if he's saved, he's not right with God. And that could be the case, but I don't think he's saved. I don't think his heart was right back up when we read that he believed and was baptized. I don't think his heart was right there. I just think he's been completely out of sync. Verse 22, they tell him, Repent, therefore, of this wickedness and pray, God, if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. Again, that just doesn't sound like advice to a carnal Christian. This is more to a lost man. Repent. Pray for forgiveness. That's, that's something we do as a lost person. Get rid of this. Therefore, this thy wickedness. And pray to God. Repentance is the key to being forgiven. And all of it is part of our salvation experience. And Peter goes on to say, For I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. Sins unconfessed could have been from jealousy or it could have been as a weak believer or as a non-believer in bitterness over the fact that he doesn't have what he sees these guys have. But he's in bitterness and the bond of iniquity that just to me that just screams the life of an unsaved person. They walk in bitterness. They walk in that bond of iniquity. They're bound to it. They can't get free from it. I preached Sunday about this next coming Sunday about the fact that we've been given liberty from that bondage. Verse 24, then answered Simon and said, pray ye to the Lord for me again. Lost man, pray for me. Pray, pray, pray for me. 
Instead of him, he told them, you go, you repent, you ask forgiveness. He said, you pray for me that none of these things which you have spoken come upon me. You know, you can't pray for another person's salvation. You can pray for their salvation, but you can't, you can't pray the sinner's prayer for them. You can't, I can't pray for you to be saved. I, I don't have that power. I had power as a nine-year-old little boy for me to be saved. But I can't pray and you'll be saved. That just won't happen. It has to come from you. He just doesn't understand. He's lost. He just doesn't understand. The, the natural man receiveth not the things of God. He doesn't understand this. This is of God. And he's still wrapped in this worldly mindset. Note this. They do not pray for him. Why? Because only he could pray for repentance. Only he could pray for that forgiveness. There's only one mediator between God and man. And that's Jesus Christ. We'll go just a little further. Verse 25. And they, the apostles, when they had testified and preached the word of the Lord, returned to Jerusalem and preach the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. Now, I told you, they came there for one reason. That was to bring them the indwelling Holy Spirit. And now they're going to go back to Jerusalem and say, Hey guys, you know what we got at Pentecost? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, it was great, man. It was awesome. Man, we're so pleased that we are the children of God. We are His chosen. And we've received it. He said, don't get, don't get too excited now. Just wait a minute. You know the dogs, the Samaritans? They received the same thing you did. And I bet you'd almost hear the mouths fall over. Mm -hmm. What? But they couldn't deny it. Because this is the way God was revealing himself. And how he was opening up the door to the church. I love the fact too that John and Peter. They preached the word of the Lord there. And then they returned to Jerusalem. And preached the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans, they got it. You know, if there was one person that was really bigoted, and we're going to see it in, the, in chapter 10, Peter. Ooh, he, I'm a Jew. I don't have anything to do with the Gentile. No, sir. In fact, after he, even afterwards, it, Paul has to get on him because he, he acts that way. But here he is. He and John are going back to Jerusalem, and they're stopping in the villages in Samaria, preaching to the Samaritans. The truth of Jesus Christ. Wow. Awesome. Amen. Amen. What's Philip doing? Philip, I think, is, I think he's grinning from ear to ear. I think he's walking the streets in Samaria and he's just having the time of his life. He's just leading people to Jesus and everything is going great. And man, he just imagines there's going to be a church here like there was in Jerusalem. God is just doing such a massive work. Praise God. That I get, to, I get to be a part of what God's doing here. Verse 26, and I'm going to close. And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise, go towards the south, unto the way of that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. <laughs> oh, God, you're such a spoiler. Amen. You know, we have to be willing to do whatever God says. Philip was going to be a man of God. He was going to preach the word of God. He was going to do what God asked him to do. And it didn't matter if everything seemed like it was going good here. It seemed like everything was wonderful here. God says, pack up and go. What did he do? He packs up and goes. Where's he going to? The desert where there's nobody. Have y'all ever seen that desert? It, it is, I mean, there is nothing out there. My son, of course, was in uh, Desert Storm. Uh, he was in um, Saudi Saudi Arabia. But that, those deserts over there are just nothing but big old sandboxes. I'm talking about nothing. We call, we call West Texas desert. That, listen, over there, West Texas is an oasis compared to that. <laughs> I, there is nothing over there. I, I don't know how anything even lives out there. I don't know that anything does. I mean, it's just terrible. And God says, pack up, buddy. You're going to the desert. Hello. Sometimes that's what we've got to do. Well, we'll look at that next week. Okay. Any question, comment, or thought? Amen. Thank you. All right. Well, then uh, we are headed towards Sunday.
And remember, if you're coming Sunday, don't forget that uh, to, uh, to uh, adhere to the suggestions that we make. Uh, we're asking those of you that come, uh, if you will, if you have a mask, bring it, wear it, uh, so that uh, you won't be spreading any germs if you might have it. And then uh, don't forget that uh, we six foot distance, and when you come in, sit behind the blue tape. You see the blue tape? That's where you sit. If there's no blue tape in front of you, you need to move. And uh, that keeps our distance. You won't believe how many churches are looking at our model. I mean, I've had several that are calling me and wanting to know. Uh, I sent out that video about how we do things, and they've called uh, one of uh, Mickey Dillard's uh, uh, friend is up north, I think. In, uh, anyway, way up north, not in Texas even, outside Texas. And he uh, messaged me and said, can I use your video uh, to show some pastors? And my son, I talked to my son today, and he said, he said, yeah, I used that video. I showed it at our church, so <laughs> it's being passed around. And, uh, so praise the Lord. But uh, let's just keep on doing what we're doing, all right? And Sunday is Mother's Day. Sunday is Mother's Day, exactly. And uh, Ruby says she's wearing a hat, so if you want to wear a hat, you can wear a hat. Those of you that are staying home, get your hats out so that you can be a part of it. We are going to have special, uh, uh, we think we are, if they show up tomorrow, we're going to have a special present for all the moms that show. And if you are staying at home, you can get one, but you won't get it before Sunday. And uh, you'll have to come to the church to get it. We can't mail them out. We can afford that. But uh, we would ask you to, to pray for us as we go to Mother's Day on Sunday. All right? I think that's it. Have we prayed yet? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this evening and for all that you've taught us. I pray, Father, that you'll continue to walk with us this week. Keep us safe, Father, from the things that are going on in the world today. But, Lord, let us walk by faith. Let us, Father, find a peace and a comfort in knowing that you are in control, that nothing's happening outside of your knowledge or ability. And we praise you for that. Thank you, Lord, for our lesson tonight. And thank you, Lord, for those we were able to pray for. Watch over us now the rest of the week. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. See you.